Well, my name is Neil Garcia, but my full name, uh, my byline is J. Neil C. Garcia. I am uh, a fellow of the Institute of Creative Writing, and I also am the director of the University of the Philippines Press. And this is actually the bookshop of the UP Press where we're shooting this. And I have been with the university for 28 years now, teaching, and uh, in the last six years also being an administrator. I write poetry and creative nonfiction and criticism, although I've tried fiction as well, uh, not too successfully, so maybe I won't venture into that, uh, not yet. The first poem is called Gift. It's the first in a cycle or a series of poems that are all called Gift. So this is Gift 1. The rhythm that hears me this day is the seas, salt born choking with weed and oysters, the movement of Piscean shapes weaving water far as the eye can see. And I am back amid the repeating waves of Pamilakan. The vessel bearing me is little else but desire, a density much heavier than our Earth's liquid nature. Its only wish is to float. It is not stillness I am seeking from this ocean, but its pain a violence of forms in the sweep of appearances, flashes of fish flying, herons and somersaulting terns, the handsome heads of cetaceans rising from abyssal depths, even the glint of shark fins, slicing the horizon like quick knives. Life caught in the maw of its own consumption, permeable, as though we all are designed to pass through each other like food, Plankton sifting into the fine tooth comb of baleen, sunlight rippling past riptides to reach the sightless bottom of rock. And you are everywhere, even as you are nowhere in sight, for here is the place things cherished are laid bare in, the edge of bodies knowing, the edge of the world. And I know my task for the day is no different from the tides to take in and let go, to push against land and pull away, to love you without claims. For nothing given is ever owned, and ghosts we already are of fickle matters imaginings. I told you I am yours for the kill. I can never take it back. Let this gift pass through the self's fictive openings, allow it brief residence someplace in the soul. True, not even the sea can hold us. But listen, its real bequest, it's not loss. It is transformation. Glass fished out from among a shore's brittle ruins is never quite glass, but a muted shard of water, all the ocean pressed against the palm. An empty shell, a grainy piece of coral. The gift is yours to keep or not to. I can no more reclaim it than the sea disown its salt. For love, how do you unbreathe a breath? Thank you. Song of Eurydice. Understand that I am dead, dear poet, and do not need your saving. My underworld sleeps at the bottom of the sea, a wet conclusion I had long foreseen. Tranquil, yes, but far from dark, for here shift fish and coral bearing the sun in their bodies, hammered into such shapes as only the tides can conceive. Colors? I have those. The dappled citrons, gentians, and pinks of your hothouse blooms, worn as skin by prey and cool predator alike. I am never alone, sweet musician, for this I have discovered about the ocean. Boundless as dream, it catches every memory we may care to hold fast and casts it a shimmering shadow in water. Clear midnight in your eyes, moles rioting on your cheeks, your sleek boyish head tilting as you smile, your slightly turned lip, the flowing length of your torso lapping against my thigh, limpid notes from your harp swimming to me again and again, fleet accompaniment to the humpback songs 
of mellow war and courtship. Born out of brine, these forms I can embrace without fear, for they and I surge as one wave, a spangled rhythm repeating itself without end. I know you wait, still and teary-eyed upon the warm and rippled surface, but you must see, here I am free to love you beyond the encumbrance of a body, animal always needing to be fed. Fizzy outpourings, a happiness eddies through me with every tidal pulse, the birth of another moon upon the world's nether brim, the sheerest stirrings of life inside the sea's lambent cradles. From where you sit in the pith of your craft, I may strike you as requiring release, and indeed your vision plummets now to touch me with salt-edged words, your hurt elegy. But understand, it is I who have released you by escaping into meaning's murmurous deep. Bereft of me, you have needed to strain to hear, to pitch the net of your voice far, far into the vast and echoing blue. Listen, you can sing again, my precious one. Already you have saved us both. Thank you. Uh, gift one is the first in a sequence of poems that are all called gift. And uh, the situation for all of those gift poems is the same. Uh, the poet is the lover and the poet is addressing the beloved. And the beloved in all the poems is equated with the ocean. And also desire is equated with the ocean. And so um, it, the whole series, the whole uh, sequence would be full of aquatic and oceanic imagery and metaphors. And uh, I was inspired to do this, not only because I was um, at the time in love, but also because I kept going to the south of the country, particularly Bohol, Cebu, Sikihor, and Dumaguete for maybe around six years uh, uh, straight. And I just realized maybe halfway through that, that you know this was a perfect sort of occasion to situate poetry in. So I wrote those poems there. And then the second one, your Song of Eurydice, um, may have come out around the same time, I'm not sure now, but uh, it's uh, an example of one of my favorite poetic activities, which is um, called Mythopoeia. It is a retelling of mythology using uh, contemporary metaphors and imagery uh, in order to make relevant the old mythologies or stories, but also to con to try to see if these old stories still contain wisdom that has not been accessed yet. So in my retelling of the Song of Eurydice, I um, make Eurydice, who is the muse, who is also the beloved and who is also departed, talk to the artist, who is the poet, and the one who is trying to rescue her. And in addressing him, she ends up talking about the value of art which is really the only redemption we have from finitude or mortality. And so, uh, yes, it's, it's my own take on, on Orpheus and Eurydice, but again, the setting is the ocean, and instead of a rocky sort of uh, volcanic underworld, you have uh, the bottom of the sea as the graveyard or the resting place of Eurydice. Um, hmm. It's very modest to talk about what's good about anything you've written, <laughs> but I think that, uh, for at least for the first one, I would say I like the way the articulation um, meanders towards the idea of writing itself, because somewhere in that poem, um, uh, the poet is mentioned as being in a craft and craft is both art and also a sea vessel and so literally you know the poet there is on a boat let's say but it's also the poems actually referring to the craft of writing itself as a way to sort of access you know the deeper meaning of love and the deeper meaning of the world around us including the ocean and for the second poem um, I like all of it. <laughs> 
No, actually, I like best, I suppose, um, just the tone that I was able to arrive at of this very tender voice of, of Eurydice addressing Orpheus. Uh, in the typical way that story is told, Orpheus is the lover and the beloved is Eurydice, and Eurydice doesn't really have any speaking lines. But here, I give Eurydice more or less center stage, and she's able to talk back. And she tells and she tells Orpheus and encourages him to keep creating and not to bother anymore about literally saving her. Because by creating, by producing songs, by writing poetry, he is already saving both of them. So it is, uh, it is I think, all about the power of love, but also about the power of art and language and poetry to make permanent what is really just transitory. Because love is a transitory feeling unless you make it permanent through something like art. Um, I don't want to say that what I've done is any different from what other poets or other writers and artists have done. I think all of us who are working in the arts are more or less trying to accomplish the same thing, which is to um, make the world fresh again and make perception new again so that we can be alive again. Because ordinary life has a way of automatizing or habituating our perception so that we don't see life anymore, we don't see the world anymore. What art does is it disrupts this habit so that it's almost like we are regressing when we are in the middle of art, where it's when we're experiencing art, we are being taken back to childhood when our eyes were open wide and when Every experience was new and fresh and memorable and meaningful. So I think in a way, I, I would like to believe that my, my, my attempts at poetry and my attempts at nonfiction and the other creative forms I've been doing, even my critical uh, writing, they are all uh, trying to contribute to this effort to defamiliarize uh, the familiar in order to get my reader or my audience to see the world again and from that point maybe think of how to make the world better because I think eventually all art is about trying to imagine a better reality, trying to imagine a better condition for humanity and for the rest of creation. So it's not just our well-being as a species but it's the well-being of everyone else, all the other creatures of the world and uh, the world itself, you know. So, there. Is that all right? <laughs> Sounds like a beauty pageant answer. <laughs>